Good evening, everyone. So good to see you in our holiday week. Didn't know if we'd have anybody here tonight. I'm so glad. Fantastic. As you know, we're not having services tomorrow because of uh, Thanksgiving, so I hope everybody's got a wonderful week planned, and I know that it'll be just a blessing for you and your families, I hope and pray. Um, We were working this afternoon on our upcoming uh, program that you're going to all hear about this Sunday if you're here at all three services. Uh, We have a subcommittee from our finance committee that is going to be issuing out for our two-week teaching on our pledge campaign for 2016 and it's a new twist our lay leader is heading it up and it really is fantastic it really is great and so uh, we were working on that and pulling that together and so I think it's going to be very good we're going to add that into uh, the service on Sunday all three services and then next Tuesday and Wednesday we'll remind everybody because we have packets to give in case uh, some folks only come on Tuesdays or Wednesdays and we want to make sure everybody has a packet full of testimonies from uh, folks, some of our young folks, about what this church has meant to them. Really good, good. Because we always try to emphasize that our general fund is our main mission, our main ministry of our church. It's how we take care of the needs. And out of that main mission ministry, we support missions through the United Methodist Church all over the globe. Did you know that a church this size sends out $50,000 a year? That's, that's the tithe of what we bring in to United Methodist Global Missions. And that doesn't include our second mile giving that you hear about on Sundays. That's just out of our general fund. So every penny you put into the offering plate, general fund, a good portion of that goes to ministries all over the world. Isn't that amazing? You say amen? Amen. Uh, I want to begin tonight uh, with a different type of religion 101. If I can, I do want to mention also that our model is here again tonight. Uh, Linda, do you have a scarf on yet? No. Oh! <laughs> Just a reminder again that on Tuesdays and Wednesdays during the holiday season, our own model, and I think she's just like Vanna White, don't y'all agree, uh, is modeling Amanda's uh, scarves. And again, uh, it's 100% goes to missions. We're not doing this on Sunday because we have, we're asking too much on Sundays, as we all know, especially during the holiday season. But because of the program for Fair Trade, which is a wonderful international program, Half of the uh, gift goes to that, and these are donations, and the other half goes for these uh, young girls uh, that have been a part of human trafficking within the United States, and they have rescued a number of those girls, and one girl is working for Amanda, and she's actually the one that sewed together these scarves. So afterwards, if you want to, uh, we laminated a a little uh, area over there with the announcement, and uh, uh, Linda will be modeling. You ought to just go there just to see her model. Uh, the different scars, all of them are unique and different colors. But again, 100% goes to the mission. This is uh, my daughter, Amanda, uh, has a job, so she takes care of her own needs. So these go into the mission and ministry field. So if any of you are interested, we've already sold 10 of those, which is really cool. And uh, so we're real excited about that. I want to share just a few minutes tonight uh, the history of football. Um, you might say, what in the world's that got to do with anything? And you'll see why here in just a minute. Um, this time of year, our nation almost idolizes this sport. It used to be baseball. Football is taking America by force. Are we being too aggressive with this? There's a lot of injuries that's hitting the news, the national news, uh, outside of sports about the young men that are being injured, uh, head injuries. Or the opposite of that, are we being, uh, trying to be too passive with this sport? What would Jesus do? If Jesus was walking on the face of the earth uh, right here and now, would he go to a football game? Would he pray, what team would he pray for? <laughs> what, what would he do, you know? And so I found this article. Uh, this is from uh, Hillsdale College, one of the great colleges of the United States. And I thought it was excellent. So let me just share it with you, and then you'll see where I'm heading to uh, this evening for prayer. On November the 18th, 1876, 
Theodore Roosevelt, a freshman at Harvard, who had just turned 18 years of age, attended his very first football game. Destined for great things, he was enthusiastic about athletics in general and eager to see the new sport of football in particular. So here he was at the second game ever played between Harvard and its great rival, Yale. Now, these are not considered big football schools today, but they were a little over 100 years ago. Walter Camp, one of the players in the game that Teddy Roosevelt watched in 1876. Anybody remember that game? I just, just want to make sure. A t- <laughs> Mr. Camp was a decent player at the time, but he made his real mark on football as a coach and a rules maker. Indeed, he is the closest thing there is to football's founding father. In the rivalry between the president of Harvard, whose name was Elliot, and Mr. Camp, we see one of the ongoing controversies in American politics at its very outset. The conflict was this, between regulators that were bent on the dream of a world that had no risk, and those who resist such an agenda in the name of their understanding of freedom and responsibility. Elliot and other progressives identified a genuine problem with football, that people were getting killed. But their solution was radical. They wanted to regulate football out of existence because they believed that its participants would not be able or capable of making their own judgments in terms of the cost and benefits. In their higher wisdom, these elites would ban the sport for all because a number of people actually were being killed literally being killed. When they had the pile up in the game, they were elbowing and busting it. I mean, it was just a different game in that time. Into this struggle stepped Theodore Roosevelt. As a boy, he had suffered from chronic asthma to the point that relatives wondered if he would survive childhood. His mother and father tried everything to improve his health, even resorting to quack cures such as having him smoke cigars. Everybody knows that's a healing uh, way, amen? Ultimately, they concluded that he simply would have to overcome the disease himself. They encouraged him to go to the gym, and as he worked out daily, the asthma would stay with Roosevelt for years. But by the time he was an adult, it was largely gone. For Roosevelt, the lesson was that a commitment to physical fitness could take a scrawny boy and turn him into a vigorous young man. That was his interpretation. Chances are he just outgrew asthma, okay? But in his understanding, going to the gym is what did it. This experience was deeply connected to Roosevelt's love for football. He remained a fan as he graduated from Harvard, entered politics, ranched out west, and became an increasingly visible public figure. In 1895, shortly before he became president of the New York City Police Commission, he wrote a letter to Walter Camp. And this is a fascinating letter. He says... This is Roosevelt. I am very glad to have a chance of expressing to you the obligation which I feel all Americans are under to you for your championship of athletics. The man on the farm and in the workshop here, as in other countries, is apt to get enough physical work. But we are tending steadily in America to produce sedentary classes, those that just sit. And from this, the athletic spirit has saved us. Of all games, I personally like football the best, and I would rather see my boys play it than we see them play any other. Now, that's a lot different than what our present president had said. I thought that was interesting. I have no patience, Roosevelt said, with the people who declaim against it because it necessitates rough play and occasional injuries. Now, occasional injuries are death. I want you to know that, okay? Occasional injuries. The rough play, if confined within manly and honorable limits, in, uh, is an advantage. It is a good thing to have the personal contact about which the New York Evening Post snarls so much. And no fellow is worth his salt. <laughs> I love it. If he minds an occasional bruise or a cut. Being nearsighted, I was not able to play football in college, and I never cared for rowing or baseball, so that I did all my work in boxing and wrestling. They are both good exercises, but they are not up to football. I am utterly disgusted with the attitude of President Elliott and the Harvard faculty about football. I do not give a snap 
<laughs> for a good man who can't fight and hold his own in the world. A citizen has got to be decent, of course. That is the first requisite. But the second and just as important is that he shall be efficient. And he can't be efficient unless he is Manly. Nothing has impressed me more in meeting college graduates during the 15 years I've been out of college than the fact that on the average, the men who have counted most have been those who have sound bodies. Now, the conclusion of all this. When Roosevelt ascended to the presidency of the United States, football remained controversial and Harvard's Elliot continued his crusade for prohibition. In 1905, Roosevelt was persuaded to act. And this is a good movement working together with a problem. He invited Walter Camp of Yale to the White House, along with the coaches of Harvard and Princeton. These were the three most important football teams in the country at the time. That's funny to me. Football is on trial, said Roosevelt, because I believe in the game. I want to do all I can to save it. He encouraged the coaches to eliminate brutality, and they promised they would. Now, you know that that was a valid promise, right? I want you to stop being brutal. We'll do that. If you keep, let us keep playing, we will. At the end of the 1905 season, therefore, Reed plotted with a group of reform-minded colleges to form an organization that today we call the NCAA and to approve a set of sweeping rules, changed, changes to reduce football's violence. As a result, Experience, football experienced an extreme makeover. The yardage necessary for the first down increased from five yards to ten. I'm sure that you probably didn't know that. I didn't. Rule makers also created a neutral zone at the line of scrimmage, limited the number of players who could line up in the backfield, made the personal foul, okay, when they bust each other up, made the personal foul a heavenly penalized infraction, and they banned the tossing of ball carriers. I have no idea what that is except they picked up guys and threw them. So I, I assume that's what it, I, they decided to ban that. That was probably a good idea. These, <laughs> these were the important revisions and each was approved with an eye toward improving the safety of the players. Yet the change that would transform the sport the most was the introduction of the forward pass. Up to this point, football was a game of running, kicking, not throwing. There were quarterbacks, but there were no wide receivers. It took a few years to get the rule right. Footballs needed to evolve from their watermelon-like shape and become more aerodynamic, and coaches and players had to figure out how to take advantage of this new offensive tool. But on November the 1st, 1913, football moved irreversibly into a modern era. Now, what fascinates me with this sport is that I played football one game, I mean, Actually, I didn't even make it to the game. I went to one practice, and I got injured in my very first practice in freshman and was banged up pretty bad. So I retired from football at a very young age and, uh, and have been on the sidelines ever since. And, uh, but I, I'm fascinated that I love it. I love to watch it, the college. I, I don't care much about the pros. That's just me. But I love it, and it bothers me that I love it. You know, I watch these guys, and I watch them, bam, somebody knocks someone, and, 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 you know, it's an incredible tackle, and I'm thinking, praise God, and then I'm thinking, I hope he didn't get hurt, you know, I just, you know, I, and I think, why would I even want to watch something like this, you know? So my question tonight, because I have a great testimony for next Tuesday night about Johnny Unitas. Anybody remember Johnny Unitas from the 50s and 60s? What a great football player, if you love the sport. Um, I just, I wonder... You know, what is inside of us? Are we returning to the gladiators, you know, that we just want to see punishment and pain? I'll get to you in just a minute there, Aggie. And or, or are we really just, just enjoying, if, all the way back to Aggie there, are we just, in, is it a good thing that we can get our aggressiveness out there instead of, uh, you know, attacking somebody at the workplace? I don't know. But I know that a lot goes on with football. It's become a major, major money sport, and it has become America's favorite pastime. So as a church, what do we do with that? I joke about it all the time, but really, you know, the sport, so many people are being injured. We know that. And uh, I, I don't know. We just need to pray about it. It does affect every one of us. Aggie, go ahead. I would just like to share with you, um, back in the 70s, I was a Jehovah's Witness. Mm -hmm. And they did not allow football to be watched because oh. they considered it as the Roman days as yes, the, gladiator. the gladiator sport yes and 
and all the people that didn't go to church because they were there at the football game. <laughs> so exactly. I don't Thank know you. How I did they, not know that that was one of the rules of the of that church. Oh my goodness. I don't know how they view it now because that was a long time ago. Yeah, a long, long, but, long time ago. That's back in my day and age, Aggie. <laughs> but back in the I early know 70s. I, I come in from a family that loves football. Our yes. daughter played football. Oh wow. And Pensacola. Mm-hmm. So. Oh gosh. <laughs> well, I don't know. I know it's a it's a it's a fun sport to watch. Let's let's bring the microphone up here for a minute here. Uh, uh, but I just it is very aggressive and very assertive and very painstaking. Jerry, I have two two statements to make. I think it's getting to where the tail is wagging the dog. Yes. And I also think, in a more positive vein, I guess, that a lot of young men have been able to get a college education because of their prowess yes. in football but a lot of times they turn their head on the academics yes they do and a lot of them never graduate exactly they, once they run out of their time for playing they're gone yeah. so it, it i love i had brothers who played football mm -hmm. my oldest brother was called the toe because he played for the baptist college in my hometown and he did all the kicking oh. and I love it but I have to be related to it to enjoy it exactly there you go and I, I think you're right it's the idea that in front of us the the reality is uh when you're talking about the tail wagging uh the dog it's the the money is is the wagging and it's it's influencing these young kids there are injuries all around and um it is it it can become idolatrous it really can. Uh, who else had the microphone here? Yes, Bill. You talk about pitching the players back in the early days of football when they were on the goal line and trying to score. Mm -hmm. Some of the big tackles would grab the running back with the ball and toss, toss him, him over the line to get him into That's the end zone. That's what they meant then. That's, That's it, Bill. Been. Goodness, I didn't know you remember back from 1876. That is amazing. <laughs> I had no idea. Really, that makes sense now. Just pick them up and shoom, sell them across there. Well, I tell you, all kidding aside, uh, Florida State needs your prayers this uh, weekend uh, as they play Florida. That ought to be a lot of fun, and uh, hopefully nobody gets hurt. Uh, you know, goodness gracious. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, and I thank you for living in a country where we do have freedoms. Interesting in this one, Lord, uh, in the article, it sounds political. It sounds like the same issues uh, that run our country, the two diverse sides. One where we uh, try to make decisions for other people, and then the opposite extreme where we think people should be able to do whatever they want. And so where do we, where do we set our rules and regulations? Father, we just ask that you help us, help us, guide us, lead us, direct us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you give to us. We ask that you forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In your holy name we pray. And may all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let's jump right into our study tonight. I want to go back to Matthew. Uh, Fran has the microphone, as she's already done, and been uh, bringing it around. And so good to have Fran back. You're just a lot prettier than that guy that was passing around that microphone. So um, I'm sorry, Dale. Didn't mean to pick on you that way. Uh, Dale and uh, Bud uh, helped me out, Miss Debbie, uh, for our baptism uh, when that cold, when it was it had that cold snap. And, and I love the pictures. If you haven't seen the pictures, uh, even if you weren't at the baptism, you ought to look at those because it shows the four of us in the water and the folks are coming in and we're standing you can tell that we're freezing as we're trying to put the people under the water there I want to go back to the passage on angels and just back up for just a few minutes real quickly mention at least the different verses that we were looking at the one in Matthew uh, starts with uh, chapter 18 verse 10 and the context is that Jesus is talking about those young in the faith and he is even using a literal child. He lifts him up and talks about that you should not offend one of these little ones, the context. But as we spoke last time, the idea is young in the faith. So it doesn't mean that just a young person. It could be just a person that is growing in their faith. And we see that same concept used even by the Apostle Paul when he's talking about those that were struggling with eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols in the epistle writings. That was a, a real issue of that day and how he says these people that are young in their faith do not 
offend them. If it bothers them, even though you know it's not wrong, then you be careful so that you don't offend them and hurt their faith because they're young in the faith. So that's the same concept here. It says in verse 10 of chapter 18 of Matthew, Jesus said, See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. And if you were here last week, we were just breaking down where angels are used in the Bible in reference to who they are. And here, all the young in faith have angels, as well as young, literal young people as well. So that's a whole lot of folks. We also lifted up Daniel chapter 10, verse 13 last week that said that nations have angels that look after them. Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, we lifted up last week, says that churches have angels as well. And again, if you were here last week, we wondered if the angel that represents the United States of America, you know, if his robe or her robe is in red, white, and blue, you know, just, we were just saying that, you know, just for fun, but the idea that each nation, each church, and it appears each individual. We also lifted up the passage uh, from the story of Peter, that after the death and resurrection of our Lord that was in prison, an angel came and set him free, and then when he came and knocked on the door, and they were praying that he would be set free, they sent... uh, this young lady to the door to see who it was. She saw it was Peter. She come run back inside. She never opened the door. He continues to knock. But when she expressed to him that Peter was out there, they didn't believe her. And they finally said, well, maybe it's Peter's angel, which meant there was a concept that every individual has an angel to take care of them. So the Bible's very clear that angels are everywhere, at least when you read these scriptures. What I wanted to do tonight is share a little bit about the types of angels. Seraphim, the two that we know about, seraphim are, are the angels that, that seem to relate to us, come down to us. The Bible says to don't forsake entertaining, don't forsake ministering to strangers because some have entertained angels unawares. So there's another passage about angels being here. And I told a personal story about uh, how that I felt that an angel intervened in my life, whether it was or not, I don't know. Remember that the word is angelos in the Greek, just means heavenly messenger. Well, there are the cherubim angels, and there may be many other types as well, but these are crazy looking. So what I'd like us to do tonight, if you'll turn to the Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter 1. And let's just read through that, and then we're going to... Ezekiel's also the one that prophesizes about Lucifer being a cherubim, which again is the uh, one who becomes the devil. Now, you have to understand that, that when Israel, about 600 years before Christ was born, was taken into exile to the Babylonians, they would gather them all up, and they would take them to wherever they would be in exile to, and then they would move other people into the lands. It was, it was that divide and conquer mentality of that day and age. All those different countries did that to defeat a nation, to tear down their religion, their families, their, their uh, uh, marketry, just everything that they did. They just was breaking it down. So in that process, some of the prophets stayed in uh, the homeland. Others were taken to the uh, exile, like Daniel was one that was taken to the exile. Uh, Ezekiel was one taken to Babylon. This is where he has the vision. In the 13th year, verse 1 of chapter 1 of Ezekiel, in the 13th year, on the fourth month of the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kibar River, the heavens were opened and I saw a vision of God. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim. So now he's been five years in captivity. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, by the Kibar River in the land of the Babylonians. There the hand of the Lord was upon him. I looked, verse 4, and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was that of a man, but each of them had four faces, <laughs> and four wings. Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf, and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had the hands of a man. 
All four of them had faces and wings, and their wings touched one another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. You've actually got like a cube almost. You've got, a, well, it's an actually not a cube, but a four-sided. It is a cube, four-sided, and it, because the throne's in the center. And so these angels are facing different directions, and they have a different face, as you're going to see on each side. And they're moving, uh, lifting the throne of God up. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Verse 10, their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a man. On the right side, each had the face of a lion. On the left, the face of an ox. And each had the face of an eagle. So there was no back of the head or side of the head. They had a face on all four sides. Verse 11, such were their faces. Their wings were spread out upwards. Each had two wings, one touching the wing of the other creature on either side. Remember, they're back to back. Two wings covering its body. Each one went straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go without turning as they went. The appearance of the living creatures was like burning coals of fire or like torches. Fire moved back and forth among the creatures. It was bright and lightning flashed out of it. The creatures sped back and forth like flashes of lightning. So you got a picture like they're moving and he's watching that, you know, in that light. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with, with its four faces. This, verse 16, this was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like chrysolite. All four looked, like, looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting another wheel. So you've got a wheel within a wheel. One like this and the one other one like that. Okay. Um, their rims, let's see here, verse 17, I'm sorry. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions that the creatures faced, and the wheels did not turn about as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims ha- were full of eyes all around. Okay. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved, and when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would rise along with them because the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, they also stood still. When the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them because the spirits of the living creatures was in the wheels." Spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked like an expanse, sparkling like ice and awesome. Verse 23, under the expanse, their wings were stretched out one toward the other. Each had two wings covering its body. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. Then there came a voice from above the expanse, above their heads, as they stood and lowered their wings. Above the expanse, verse 26, over their heads was what looked like a throne of sapphire. High above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, so he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire, and that there was... And that from there down he looked like fire, and bright, brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance all around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of the one speaking. So what we have is you have, again, these four beings, and they're, they're, they're in like a cube beside each other. I'm not sure how big they are, but they're, you know, one's facing this way, one's facing that way, that way, and their wings touch, and they've got different faces on each side, and so, and there's a wheel within a wheel beside them, and when the wheel lifts up, they lift up. When the wheel sits down, if it goes this way, they don't have to turn, none of them, because they have a face each direction, so whichever way they go, they're facing that way automatically. And in between them is this expanse. And on the top of the expanse, that looks just like ice, you know, crystal. On that is a throne, and he sees like a, a person, but it's fiery and metal. And so, and we find out later, if you read on, we're going to stop reading there, but that's God. And so this, this goes up and down, moves across, you know, that's, that's what he sees. Now, this is ferocious-looking creatures, you know, now you might say, well, it didn't say they were angels. Well, bear with me. If you will turn to chapter 10, I think it's chapter 10, maybe it's 11. Chapter 11, I think it is. No, it's 10 verse 20, 10 verse 20. There it is. Verse 20 says, chapter 10 These were the living creatures I had seen beneath the God of Israel by the Kibar River, and I realized they were cherubim. Each had four faces, four wings. Under their wings was what looked like the hands of man. He has a vision again of the same creatures. 
Their faces had the same appearance as those I had seen by the Kibar River. Each one went straight ahead. So it, Bible always proves itself. So this passage explains to him what he saw in chapter 1. He didn't realize they were angels. He didn't know what they were. But here he realizes that they're angels of God. They're cherubim. And the cherubim seem to be the guardians of God. Okay? They're not the ones that we have that visit earth as far as we know. You know? Now, because you remember when Isaiah in uh, chapter 6, if you remember that passage, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and the angels cried, Holy, holy is the Lamb of God. Remember reading that last week? And then it said that, remember it was the year that King Uzziah died, and he had been king for so long, a very righteous king. And then so what's going to happen to the nation? What's going to happen to their, their community? And in that, now Isaiah's written many years before this passage. So they're still a kingdom. They're not in exile. What are we going to do? And who are we going to send? And remember, Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. If you remember, an angel goes to the altar of God with tongs and takes a hot burning coal and flies over to Isaiah in his vision and puts it on his lips because he said he was a man of unclean lips. And now he has been sanctified. He has been forgiven. He's been made pure. He's been made holy. He's been justified. It's very symbolical of, of the cross of Jesus Christ. But it makes it clear in Isaiah that the angel that left God and ministered to Isaiah was a seraphim, was a seraph. I believe that if, if, if Isaiah looked up and saw that beast coming towards him, <laughs> face of an eagle or the face of whatever, you know, coming at him, you know, and with the legs of calves and hands and all those, I, I, it'd freak him out, you know. So I've got a feeling that the seraphim look more like us because when he saw the image of God, you remember sitting on the throne, he said it looked like a man. It wasn't the description of these weird angels that are here, you know. Now, the cherubim do have three leaders that we know, at least three, and they were called archangels, okay? And we know that the Bible describes one as Gabriel, and remember, Gabriel's the one that comes and speaks to Mary and to John the Baptist's father. Do you remember that? Gives the pronunciation uh, or the pronouncement, and then also he speaks to Daniel, and when he's speaking to Daniel, we find out that there is another one, Michael, the archangel, who is the warrior angel and fighting the... Uh, the demonic, we'll call it, in that light. But we find out in this book, Ezekiel, as well, chapter 28, that the third archangel was a famous cherub by the name of Lucifer. So if you don't mind turning to that one, and then we'll open it up and see if you have any discussion for this. Before we leave the angels, I want to read a passage out of this little Bible tonight that somebody may want. I want to give this away tonight. Uh, chapter 28 of Ezekiel, verse 11. Ezekiel says, the word of the Lord came to me, and remember, I, and just a sideline here, if you've been here on Sundays, we've been talking about Jesus calling himself the Son of Man. The only other place that anybody called himself the Son of Man was Ezekiel, and Ezekiel used that same terminology about 70 times in his book. Jesus refers to himself about 80 times as the Son of Man. Not that, that one is the same as the other, it's just that's the terminology that they used. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And he gives a description of this king. And remember, if you've been with us over the last year, when we talk about prophecy, that when a prophet would write, many times he's writing for what is exactly happening right then and there to give advice to his country, his king. That's what the prophet was. Used to be a judge, there was no king and the judge would hear from God and they would rule the people as long as they needed them. When they got rid of the judges and set up kings, God gave them prophets. Samuel was the very last judge, became the first prophet. These prophets would speak about what was going on, but many times, if they had the gift, they could look beyond that. So their ref reference to a, a situation might reflect that situation, but obviously when you read it, as you're going to see this one, has ongoing effects as well. We see that in a variety of places. So this, this is nothing new in this passage. You were the model of perfection, it says, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. Now, you know that the king of Tyree was not in Eden. There's no way he could have been in the Garden of Eden, correct? So he's speaking beyond the king. He's given a reference to the king, what God's going to do to him, but he's also speaking about something else. We don't know what it is yet. You were in Eden, the Garden of God. Every precious stone adorns you, ruby, topaz, emerald, chrysolite, 
onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub. Again, the definition of cherub, they are the guardians of God. Okay? They're the protectors of God. So this is one of the three that we know the names of. Like I said, there may be more, but we know that. For so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless, verse 15, in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So what did I do? I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God. I expelled you, O guardian cherub. From among the fiery stones. And where was he expelled to? Here. Here. This is earth. This is where he is. This is what we know. Because he was expelled to the garden of, well, he was expelled to this world. And then he entered into the garden of Eden. Verse 17. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty. And you, you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before the king's. By your many sins and dishonest trade, you were desecrated. You have desecrated your sanctuary, so I made fire. You know, we talk about the devil, the fire uh, of consuming him, hell. So I made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you. And I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. Now we're back to the king of Tyre. All the nations who knew you were appalled at you. You have come to a horrible end, shall be no more. Well, that is the prediction of the king of Tyre, but we know that the devil's ends not till the end of Revelation. This is a powerful prophecy that he was one of the angels. He was one of the holy high angels. I mean, he was right up at the top, the very top. Got to take it back to Aggie back there. At the very, very top. Now, like I said earlier, there may be other angels that were at the top as well, but these are the only ones that the Bible has described at that level. Aggie, go ahead. Well, he was special at one time. That's why he was able to be sent. He was good at one time, too. Yes, yes. That's interesting. You know, it appears with that teaching that the angels have choices like we do. And it appears that he chose because of his arrogance, his beauty, to go against the Father. And because God in context, doesn't annihilate, didn't just get rid of him. He exiles him, according to this passage, sent him to earth. And so if, if evil's at earth and all his followers, then darkness would be covering this planet, if that's, I mean, a right interpretation. And it appears that God never lets a part of his creation stay in darkness, so he produces light, I think that's interesting. If you remember the creation story, before he creates the sun and the moon, he produces light. And light comes into this dark, verse 1 of Genesis, formless void area, and it's called the Garden of Eden. And the tree of life is there, which represents we know Jesus. And Satan is allowed to come into that garden. I mean, it's like a bubble within that dark world. Satan is allowed to come into that bubble uh, to tempt Adam and Eve. Because our understanding is that God believes in free will and wants us to choose. In other words, he tempts you to do wrong. You say, nope, I'm going to live for God. And yet Adam and Eve did what we all do. (laughs) They turned away. You know, John, right here. Any other comments, too? If you've got a comment, just raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. Go ahead, John. It's it's amazing about you talking about Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. I'm reading a book that I'll be giving you Sunday called Heaven. Oh, excellent. And it explains a All lot All these of, passages? Oh, I'll yes. look forward to it, John. And it's written by a gentleman f- here in Florida. Oh, okay. Yeah, so excellent. I'll be giving that to you someday. Thank you. And let me mention with what John is saying that I do a lot of my reading because I see we, us as a team. So you give me magazines to read and uh, religious magazines. I keep them stacked up till I can read them. <laughs> I've been reading through them, uh, you know, constantly. So different ones that give to me. So please do that. Please, articles. I, I love that very much. Ray, go ahead. Uh, you was reading there about the fire come down and put him into ashes. Yes. And then what did he do? Send the ashes to earth or did he just send the spirit to earth? That's a good question. What's your answer, Ray? <laughs> <laughs> 
I say he used the earth to make us. Yes. So then he he could do anything. He could change over to any anything. That's the reason the Garden of Eden was perfect for him. I like that. Yeah, he uses the ash who we are. I mean, remember he he made us out of the out of the dust. That's interesting. I've never thought about it that way. Wow. Wow. And neat, neat. Any other comments? Yes, Laura. Are we to assume then that Satan looks like one of these four-headed creatures because popular like in the movies and mm-hmm. everything is this person with a flowing black robe and yeah. <laughs> horns on yeah, his Yeah, the horns sticking out. <laughs> exactly. I, you know, that is a connotation that has come over the years from the medieval times. Uh, the original intention, obviously, was not that Satan had, you know, horns and a uh, long tail and dark, uh, wore black all the time, pointed boots and a black mustache, silky mustache. That has just evolved over the years. It appears that he was an angel that was absolutely beautiful. For us, thinking of the angels described in Ezekiel, that does not sound like beauty to me, (laughs) you know. But I imagine the cherubim had many different looks. And so whatever he was within that tree or within that concept, the metaphor of the tree, and I believe it was a real tree, but I mean him in there, um, I don't know what he looked like at that point. I know the punishment was, remember, for the snake. He took the form of the snake. We wonder if the snake was uh, an embodiment that had arms and legs and and just a beautiful creature. It's very confusing when you read Genesis to understand if if that's another punishment like this of him being changed or if it's just the punishment of the being that he's in being the snake. So he definitely didn't have the horns and the long tail. He will come, evil will come. You know, if, if the devil really looked like that, we would be okay. We'd say, there he is, stay away from him. He doesn't come like that. He comes like a, uh, what's the passage in the scripture? An angel yeah. of light, exactly. Angie? I'm not sure I know how to ask the question I want to ask, but on earth, when bad things happen, it's because we live in a fallen world. What made him hmm. bad being in heaven? Yeah. I guess I just always assumed heaven was perfect and exactly. no, you know nothing bad would happen but did if he could maybe come back and forth did he I don't know. I honestly I don't know. I it doesn't it there actually let's we'll go to another passage that describes him as well, there's only two in the Bible there is another one but there is not a whole lot of information there for us to understand exactly how all this happened. Um there just is the understanding that that somewhere along the line, the angels had choices, and he chose poorly <laughs> uh, in that light. And according to this passage, it's because of his arrogance. But how could you be arrogant in heaven? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Brad? I was wondering if, from what I remember, he was not the only one that was cast down. There was mm-hmm. a lot of other angels that came with him. Right. Because it seems like they got together and all... Maybe they were trying to make a, get enough together to vote against God. Yeah. Well, and it may have been a rebellion. That's, that is the, that's, a, that's a, one of the great theories of what took place. There was a rebellion in heaven, and they were exiled. They were going to fight God. And that because of the, the end times definition and revelation of, of the devil, Lucifer, coming after us and using his hordes of demons, they had to come from somewhere. So the understanding is that those were the angels of light that followed him, how could they follow? You know, I mean, it's, it is, it's just beyond our understanding uh, that they were exiled here because we know the demons are here, you know. Um, in Genesis chapter 6, it says that the sons of God married the daughters of men. And one of the great theories, one that I hold to, is that the infiltration of the demons were actually in humans and they were producing offsprings that were not normal. Because the scripture says that their offspring were giants of old. So that's not normal according to what the scripture says. And so that was one of the main reasons because of the infiltration and the evil growing by leaps and bounds that Noah had the just cause from God that the world would be destroyed. And just Noah that did not have that impure line inside of him was going to start a new creation. If you look at it that way, it makes sense why the world was judged. And so when the Bible says that we're going to get back the way of Noah, then that, if that's true, what I'm saying, then the infiltration of the demonic hosts will be beyond measure. Let's go to the other passage and, and take the microphone there. Let's go ahead. If you'll turn 
uh, to Isaiah um, chapter, I think it's chapter 14. Yeah, chapter 14, verse 12. If you'll go ahead and turn to that, that's the second Old Testament passage that is the prophet's word. And again, 100 years difference, a couple hundred years between uh, Ezekiel and Isaiah, but he speaks of Lucifer as well. I saw the microphone. Yeah, go ahead, Jerry. Uh, just thinking back to the description, said it looked mainly like a man, but it said it had legs and feet like, like that a of a calf. So yes. it sounds like hooved feet. Yes, yes, very much. So, that so sound yeah, like it, it sounds like a, like a creature feature movie. You know, I, I don't know, I, I, it, but it is a strange definition of these beings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think back to that saying that we often say, the angel on my shoulder. So yes. we each do. Each have an angel. Exactly. And we're going to see that in the passage when we finish this as well. John? In my humble opinion, mm -hmm. I believe Satan was trying to pollute the human race yes. so that the Messiah could not be born through the human people. Good point. Good point. Because that's an excellent point. Because if the infiltration of the demonic was in every lifeblood, then there could be no way that the Messiah could ever come in the Virgin Mary because she would have the evil lifeblood within her, the demonic host. I've never heard that, John. That's excellent. Excellent. Well, let me just read this passage out of Isaiah and see if this adds to our dilemma. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. Verse 13. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. Verse 14, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you stare at you. They ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made the kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a desert, who overthrew its cities and would not let his captives go home. Now here again, Isaiah is referring to the king of Babylon and then he's speaking above the king of Babylon as well. This is one of the prophecies. And as you read this with our study, you can tell very clearly that it's obviously more than just a human king that he's referring to. And these are the only two passages that seem to define where, what has happened in the ancient past. You don't, we don't know if what that rebellion, that war, and him being cast down, you know, and the hosts that followed him, we don't know if that was... A billion years. I mean, we don't know how long ago that was. Jesus said, remember? He said, I remember seeing Satan fall as lightning from the sky. So, I mean, Jesus is God, so he's been with us at all time. He remembered that, so he saw that. So we've got three passages, those two Old Testament and Jesus' statement as well, descending here upon the ground. This is Isaiah, but again, God supposedly speaking through Isaiah the prophet, you know. Any other thoughts about the angels? Oh, all the back there, Aggie. I want you to turn as well with me. Um, I'm going to read Psalm 91, if you'll turn to Psalm 91. Go ahead, Aggie. I don't know exactly where I read it, but it says that we are going to be shocked at what, kind, what Satan looks like, how he deceived the world, what kind of person he is. Yes. Little. Right, right. I, I think so. I mean, I, again, if he would come with horns and a tail, I mean, we would be able to fight him, but he definitely doesn't do that. Um, it's interesting, too, when you're trying to interpret the last book of the Bible, Revelation, there are, he's trying so much to be like Jesus, you know? Even the, uh, you know, the number of man is, do you remember what it is? Six, six, six. There's three because of the triune God, Trinity, which would be, if you called it that way, seven, seven, seven. And you have three different identities of Lucifer, his different concepts there, just like you have the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And so the battle is very clear in the end that he tries to get the armies to fight God and that when God comes, when Jesus comes out of the sky, it's over with because he's God. We have a tendency to believe that the devil and God are equal, and that's just not true. The devil is a created being, 
you know. And God is allowing him, it appears in the scriptures, to tempt us just so that we will either choose him or choose God. That may sound ferocious, but that appears to be biblically what goes on. So this is his ruling ground. He was given leadership here by Adam. You know, Adam, when he did not protect Eve and when he ate of the fruit, then according to that story, they gave ownership of this world to the devil. You know, so he is the prince of the air, as Jesus said. But Jesus makes it clear that he's coming back and he's not going to rule this world. He's going to destroy this world with fire. And then there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And I'm sure it'll have a lot of what we have now in a better uh, plateau. You know, I mean, we'll have the new bodies and it will be here, but it won't be the same. It'll obviously not be the same, you know. And the demonic, it appears, according to the scriptures again, are not annihilated. They are just removed and put in a place of torment. Our definition of torment is outside of God. You take God away and there is darkness. And when there's darkness, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's, that's hell. That's the separation of God. And, you know, I think, and I don't think humanity recognizes that, obviously, that the only reason we have light in this world is because God is here. You take God out of this horizon and we're in hell, you know. So God's presence is with us. Amen? Yeah, John, you got a mic there? We're going to read 91. I love about God is the fact that he gave us freedom of choice. Yes. We can either choose him or Satan. Mm -hmm. We're not puppets. Right. And it's our own choice where we end up. Exactly. Not God's. Right. And I think, you know, the thing is that Satan had the rule over us till the cross. The cross breaks the bond. Christ in my understanding, forgave everybody. Now, that doesn't mean everybody gets to go to heaven. You have to receive the forgiveness, but the forgiveness was for everybody, past, present, and future. And so he broke, you know, Satan's claim, you know, to hold over us. Because there's even a passage in, uh, I think it's in the book of Jude, I think it's in Jude or either First Peter, where, you know, they're arguing about the body of Moses. You know, where does Moses get to go because of his sinfulness? But Jesus, when he dies on the cross, it backs up to the very beginning of creation. You know, he cancels sin and uh, is this beautiful judge. What a beautiful story, you know. And I guess in heaven, uh, Angie, that, you know, even with the created beings, God wanted them to have choice. You know, he created us with free will. Then why wouldn't he have created the angels as well with free will? And somehow Lucifer just couldn't handle it, you know. He just just couldn't. I don't know. I I mean, it makes human sense, but it's hard to understand in the heavenly realms. You know, did he really think that he could box God's ear? He really think he could? You know, and what makes it even more messy, if you think about it, and this is my theory. I've looked at this up before. You'll remember this, um, is that, you know, was it a real struggle when Jesus and God separate? Remember that they're always one. Father, take this cup from me but not my will, but thine be done. When he becomes sin, it appears, and we may have this wrong, but it appears that the Father and Son are split, the triune God. It appears that way. Now, whether, again, I'm saying that over and over, whether it really happened or not, I don't know, but that's what it appears. If that's true, then Satan's temptation of trying to woo Jesus to his side is pretty powerful because if he could have a part of God on his side, man, can you imagine? So if that's even remotely true, that Jesus could have went to uh, the Star Wars idea, the dark side, if that's even remotely true, and I know that some probably here are saying that's impossible, but just bear with me for a minute. If that's even remotely true, then the idea that God would be willing to do that so that you might get a chance to go to heaven is incredible, is an amazing sacrificial love story. Because when Jesus dies, how's he going to be raised from, who's going to raise, what if God just said, I'm not going to raise him from the dead? I mean, he's become sin. Just think of all that now. So he's depending this part of the Godhead completely on the Father, as we call him, to raise. That's that's beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't this, yeah. Yeah, Beverly? The thing that's always kind of bothered me is that the Bible says that the devil believes and trembles, mm-hmm. so if he can't be that stupid. So if he knows this Bible book, then why doesn't he repent? Does he still have that 
the proud because if he was worshiping God, then he wanted to be like, it says he felt because of pride, and that's why pride is listed right. in the Bible as the abominable sin. Sin, yes. Uh, so. Uh, why didn't he come to his senses? Yeah, how could you be that stupid? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there must be something in it for him. I know, I know, Like I know. he gets a point, like football or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah, know. He gets the football. He gets the trophy. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't know. I, honestly, I don't know. Has anybody got an answer to that? Why would, why would the devil be so stupid? You know, why would he, you know, obviously there's something in it. We know that he's trying to wound, wound God, but if he knows he's going to lose, you know, I mean, and he knows how merciful God is. Wouldn't it be amazing if the devil repented? I mean, you know, I mean, that's not in our book. It doesn't mean that that can't happen. I mean, in our understanding of eternity, that doesn't happen. But we've got to hold to that's just our understanding of eternity, you know. Uh, the sin. Yes, yes. Well, the unpardonable sin for any of us is not to repent. And not to end yes, yes. Yeah, Irene, go ahead. Yeah, it's because um, he doesn't want to give in to God mm -mm. and he's taken as many of us with him as he can yes. and that'll hurt God more than anything well maybe he doesn't think he's gonna lose maybe he thinks you he's know a, just think about this you know how we arrogant. as Americans feel uh Linda's got one back there you know how we as Americans um feel about um we can convert anybody you know just the struggle that we're having with the Syrian refugees and how that if we can just get these people over here and Americanize them, that they'll be maybe the next president of the United States. I mean, just use that concept. And yet, there are some that will take advantage of that, you know. But that doesn't stop us from thinking, and that may be stupid, but we think that we can make a difference. I wonder if Satan just thinks because God's nature is not to annihilate me, his, I'll become his worst enemy because I'm going to always be around, even if he's punishing me in hell, and someday I'm going to find a way out of here, and someday I will take over. I wonder if he thinks that. I don't know. Linda? And just because today he believes he has that power, no Hold matter... Hold up a little bit closer. He believes that he has that power no mm -hmm. matter what. Today, he doesn't look till tomorrow, I don't think. I think okay. today he has that power, and he doesn't see beyond it. That's a good point, Linda. And isn't that what sin does, the, the immediate gratification? We don't look at what the results would be. We're just like, oh, I want it now. You know, I want that money now. You're right. That may be, and that's who he is, you know. Yes, Lorna. Yeah, I have a feeling that that old saying, pride goeth before, before a fall, fall. Exactly. is really true in this case because yeah. I think he is such a proud, proud, proud yes. person. Yes. And that is a sin. I think so. I, I mean, at least that's what we understand. I still can't understand how that Jesus, when he died and he went to hell, how that everybody didn't go to heaven with him. How could you not in hell when Jesus has given you a free ticket to heaven? How could you not go with him? Remember the folks that are there he goes and preaches to when he's dead? How could you not? And yet we know they didn't. We know not everybody went with him. I saw back there somewhere. Aggie, go ahead. Uh, Tom's accused me all week of gabbing too much. <laughs> no, Tom, Tom. <laughs> It's Aggie, not Gabby. It's, it's okay, Tom. <laughs> anyway, I was just thinking that because he knows of God's mercy, he, just like the world, will not, they think they can wait till the last second to yes. repent. Yeah, maybe, maybe he's thinking that. Maybe he thinks, well, I'll, I'll just do what I can, and then, then I'll ask the, the merciful last minute, God yeah. to forgive me. Yeah, that may be, who knows? I mean, that may well be. Any others? This is good. Good, 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 good. Yeah. Dot? Well, I think he's really full of himself <laughs> because he is the prince of this world. Yes, he is. And That's therefore, he has so much power mm -hmm. here on earth. Exactly. But now I think his power, if my understanding theologically is correct, that it was broken at the cross. But if he can deceive us, then deception is a more powerful tool than anything. You can be a person without any power, but if I convince you that I have power, then I've got power over you, even though it may not be real, but it's real in your eyes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, John, and then we'll go here well, and then back what over I, to Ray. What, what I want to say is how many in this church are really with the Lord and will be with him? I hope everybody. 
Tom. I do too, and I pray that everybody will. I pray that will. too. Because you are such a good shepherd, there's uh -huh. no reason for uh, them not to. Oh, uh, thank you, John. You get the quarter for the night. <laughs> <laughs> We've got right over here, uh, Barbara, and then Ray, and then I'm going to read Psalm 91. <laughs> hold up, hold up, hold up, Barbara. We want to make sure. Okay, thank you. Go what, ahead. What makes Satan such a good deceiver is that he's a phenomenal uh, <laughs> Too many an imitator. There, <laughs> he's a phenomenal imitator. True. In Revelation, we True. see that he establishes a trinity yes. just like Jesus, Jesus, exactly. And exactly. Uh, he uses that trinity with all the arrogant power that he yes, has. Yes, his ideas are not original. No, they I are love not. That. That's no. true. That's true. Excellent. Ray, where well, they're bringing it over to you. As they're bringing it to Ray, let me just read the psalm. I don't know if it's verse 1 or not, but it's verse Psalm 91, so I hope it is. It doesn't have the verses. It says, You live in the shelter of the Most High. Is that verse 1? Yes, yes. Good. Who abide in the shadow of the Almighty will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone you will tread on the lion and the adder the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot those who love me I will deliver I will protect those who know my name when they call to me I will answer them I will be with them in trouble I will rescue them and honor them with long life I will satisfy them and show them my salvation word of God for the people of God once again, this is the passage, remember, that the devil used against Jesus about the angels. And the promise is for us and Jesus to be protected by our angels. Ray, go ahead, sir. You know, you was talking about him going down into the darkness. Yes. Well, he went down to the darkness to, to let the people recognize who God was. Yes. But then he asked for forgiveness. Yes. And came back. Yes. He got his repentance out of the darkness so he could be with God again. Amen. You know, my dad and I used to fight about that, Ray. We had such great fights. I miss, my, miss fighting. Ray, maybe you and I can start fighting over these things. Daddy and I used to fight, uh, you know, because I, I always thought that, that Jesus went all the way into the belly of the earth, into hell, like you're talking about there, Ray. So maybe you and I probably agree on this. Daddy didn't think he went to hell. Daddy thought he only went to paradise. And he said, because in paradise, that's, remember when Jesus gave that vision, that there, and that was a Jewish mindset, there was a separation in death of paradise, and then the river in between, and what we call uh, Hades, or hell. He believed that Jesus just descended until paradise and then carried captivity that was in paradise captive in his train and took them to the new heavens so therefore he said eddie those folks never got a second chance you know that were in hell he said because they wouldn't have been in hell if they deserved a second chance they would have been in in abraham's bosom does that make sense or paradise they would not have been in hell that was reserved for those that would never repent those that had even a chance of repentance <laughs> would have been maybe on the lower totem pole, but they would have been in, in uh, the good place, Abraham's bosom. And, and Daddy just held on to that. I said, you're wrong, Daddy. <laughs> you're wrong. I, think, I said, he went into hell. He went down to the pit because he was sinful. Just what you're saying, Ray. He was just, Ray, you got to disagree with me. He was, you know, you got to have somebody disagree with me. He was, he was filled with sin. You know, he became our sin, so he had to be, it had to be burned off of him. The repentance had to come, the change. And when it was all burned off in hell, there's nothing but that pure soul that he never sinned himself. Amen? Go ahead, Ray. Yes, exactly. That's who he is. You, you and I are still agreeing, Ray. That's not going to work. I got to find somebody to disagree. Amen. Amen. Monty. This is kind of a technical question. The, the cherubim had the three faces, right? Four faces. Okay, four. Uh, 
over the Ark of the Covenant, those were cherubim, right? No, not, I mean, that we see in, in the Bible. The Ark. Um, and my point, my question is, yeah, I know is, what you're saying. Yeah, over faces the mercy on those, seat. And the replicas that we see, are there any faces on them? Um, no. No, because they're facing each other, their wingspans. But I do not remember, is it, are they called cherubim? I honestly, I've forgotten. Are they called the cherubim? I honestly don't know if all cherubim, just like when you was talking about, Angie was talking about, again, about Lucifer, I'm not sure if all cherubim had those different faces. We just know that the cherubim around the throne in heaven have those faces, but maybe there's other cherubim that look different. You know, I've heard some people say that Lucifer in the tree uh, tempting Adam and Eve looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, and that's what tempted her, you know. I, so I don't know, but you're right. With the cherubim, at least the depiction that God gave them, the cherubim over the mercy seat, all you see is those wings. You don't see any kind of face of an eagle or different things. But I don't think there's a description of that. That's a good point. Beverly, you was about to say something, weren't you? I just said, I think I agree with you. Oh, God. Nancy, <laughs> well, Daddy was wrong, darling. Nancy just reminded me, what about when Christ said to the prisoner on those cross right today, today. be with me in paradise. paradise oh i get one mark for daddy you and you and beverly here did you get that you remember jesus didn't he said today you'll be with me in paradise the thief on the cross now see you know how i got around that actually daddy argued that let me tell you what i told daddy in, in other words he went to paradise first and then he thank you john thank you thank you bill then he descended you know, he had to, he's on his journey. You know, he picked up, he said, I'm going to get some hot wings. He was on his way. He's on his way, you know. Well, listen, we're going to stop there. And I would like, if anybody, this is a Bible given to me by Bill uh, Kitchens, one of our new members. Fran has brought Bill and uh, Dawn in. She helps at the uh, thrift store. Gave me a number of Bibles. I already gave them out to the scouts. This is for anybody that is, it's called Strength for Service, a New Testament. If you know of anybody that would like to have this, I have all these Bibles I keep giving out. That uh, it could be a police officer, a fireman, could be a military person. Or if you wouldn't need a New Testament, they're right here. Aggie, you got somebody? Excellent. Right here. Just there you go. Uh, yeah, it was different than my NIV. It's not NIV. I don't know. It is, it is, it is. In our new revised standard version, it's the new revised standard version like in your pew Bibles, but it's the new revised. Just like we have the new King James, it's the new revised. Yes, sir. Yeah, Bill. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. There's a big chunk. But that's a different one. Isn't yeah, actually, Bill, I can't hold that. I, I, I could use that one, but that's a good point. Bill said in the original Apostles' Creed that, remember, the Apostles' Creed dates all the way back to the Roman Creed, which was the baptismal creed of the early converts, dates all the way back within the early disciples, the first, first century. You know, that's where the Apostle Creed comes from. We have it dated all the way back. And it says... In the scriptures that he descended into the place of the dead, descended into hell, right? Right, right? Hades. But what it actually said, <laughs> to be fair, is he descended into Sheol, which is the place of the dead, which covers both areas, which is which was valid that he went from one to the other, but we don't have the proof of that. But that was good. Anybody ever wonder why we've taken that out? I was with a whole bunch of Episcopalians, and they said, why have you taken God out of hell? They told me that, and I was like, what, 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 what? Did you know that the oldest, oldest, oldest uh, manuscripts that we have, the most reliable oldest manuscripts, do not have that. Have what we do at 11 o'clock, and it was because it was redundant. The idea that when you died, everybody knew that you went to Sheol. So when he died, there was no reason to say he descended to the dead. He obviously, everybody did. You see what I mean? And so later on, we have that they added that phrase into the Apostles' Creed. And uh, so it's actually a relatively new phrase compared to the old version. But I like that, Bill. That's a, that's a good, that's a little, that's at least a, a halfway mark. <laughs> Let's hold here, and we're going to pick up next week. I want to just start reading. If you'll turn back to Matthew for just a moment. Um, there's so many great passages. We're going to start with verse 15 of chapter 18 now uh, of Matthew. And it talks about 
just the teachings of Jesus. And I, I found something here in my studies this week I've never seen before. I, I've not realized. That's why I just love as we keep studying the Bible, we keep finding new things. You know, I know Barbara and I have talked about this before too with her teaching on Tuesday mornings. The more you study, the more you find out that you don't know. That's what's so amazing. This, starting with verse 15, is, is the idea of forgiveness. And um, you remember when Peter, you know, uh, if I, my brother offends me, you know, how many times do I have to forgive him? And he's 70 times seven. Um, that actually, there's a, that, that is there for a specific reason going back to Genesis. Everything goes back to Genesis. In Genesis chapter four, there, it, that exact quote is there. And we'll talk about that next week. But as you begin to read this passage, uh, it, the different stories, the different parables um, are great. But what I found out is that when you get to chapter 21, 22 and 23, at least in Matthew, Jesus is furious with the leaders of the church. Three whole chapters. He is furious. He, he condemns the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians. One story after story, parable after parable, even right to their face. You know, you whitewash tombs. He was so aggravated with the leaders of his church of that day, the hypocrisy. I just never have actually seen it encapsulated like that before. And I thought, wow. I mean, I just, I thought, my gosh. And I backed up. I said, how long does this go? And it's three whole chapters that he is so upset. And then he goes into his, his and we'll do that again, chapter 24, where he talks about the end of times. And then we have, of course, the cross. So it'll be a good study from there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all that you've given to us. Thank you for the great discussion tonight. Father, we thank you for Thanksgiving. I know that everybody uh, probably going to be with friends or family, and we hope everybody has that tonight. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would just take care and bless and guide and direct. Those that might be on the road, keep them safe. Those that might have family traveling to see them in the next couple of days, keep them all safe. They've put a lot of uh, reservations, you know, reserves, supposedly, because of terrorist activity. They're just That's always a fear. We just ask for your hedge of protection, hedge of protection around our loved ones. Father, I, I just feel led. I hope you don't mind me tonight, Laura, mentioning your brother Frank. We just want to lift up Frank tonight, uh, very ill. So many of you have family members that are very ill. We only know the ones that are listed in our prayer concerns. Uh, Charlene Gunn had to postpone her cancer surgery. This is Wayne Evelyn Clark's daughter. So, Lord, we just pray over the holidays there coming in to see Wayne and Evelyn, I think, tonight. Just keep them safe. And as she prepares for her cancer surgery. Others, I know you, uh, different ones of you have needs. Just let's do like we've done, done before in closing. Just if you have a special family friend that just needs a special touch tonight, just lift your hand as a symbol of solidarity. Lord, you see our hands waving before you. We lift up these needs. We believe in the power of prayer. So we ask all of the hands that are lifted up that those needs will be met, that you know what is right, your will be done, your healing, gracious touch, mind, body, spirit, soul. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and may all of God's people say, Amen, amen and amen. Have a marvelous Thanksgiving.